Cool. Hey, I'm joined by Phil Wainwright, Diginomica. How are we doing? John, hi. Pretty good. Pretty good. So you caught me just as I was uh, about to head off for a week's vacation. Um, so yeah. and, and you said, you said, Phil, are you up and about or are you winding down? And the, the honest answer is both at the same time. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, you're responding to my messages. So I was like, ah, you might still be a good, good video victim. Um, and, and you left a little bit of controversy in your wake. So I wanted to uh, discuss your, your blog post on mock washing, which is like mm -hmm. next generation cloud washing. So we got to like, get get on alert here on like not not mock washing and like getting it right, not getting into trouble because the mock alliance is like pointing fingers you don't want to be on yeah. that list. Yeah. You don't want to be on that list. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's fascinating because of course I've been through the whole cloud washing thing right from the start. I fought many battles with people who asserted that they were cloud and clearly had no real understanding of what it was actually all about. And, and Mark is um, uh, it's an acronym that was created by uh, the Mark Alliance, uh, uh, which is a kind of trade association um, that really wants to kind of set the standards. Having seen what happened with cloud washing, they want to set the standards for what is effectively the next iteration of cloud computing. Um, I think once you've moved into the cloud, once you've gone truly cloud native, what then happens is that the old monolithic applications start to decompose um, and, um, uh, and, and, and it becomes much more a case of like assembling the functionality and the data that you need to get the job done, um, crossing across those old enterprise boundaries. Uh, and it's all about microservices, it's about APIs, it's about cloud-based SaaS, that's the C in Mac, and headless is the H, um, and so that's why they came up with this uh, with this acronym. But but uh, they're still really effectively defining what is the essence of true kind of. Uh, I was calling it the platonic ideal last week because um, you know we live in the real world and no one is going to do this perfectly. But you need to have an ideal as to what it should look like, and then everyone can try and approximate to that. Uh, and um, uh, and there's a lot of vendors out there that say, okay, you know, we're composable, and therefore, you know, we're we're uh, we're on this trend, uh, and they haven't got a clue. Right, and this is actually one of the more interesting shows that I like watch you go to each year. You're in Amsterdam this year for this one. But tell me mm -hmm. a little bit about tell me a little bit about like how you've seen this evolve because obviously this is pretty next gen stuff. So, like, are we at the point now where we're seeing broader adoption? Like, have you seen this shift over the last years going to this event? Um, yeah, so it's kind of interesting because the market lines. Um, I mean, I happen to know how this all got started because one of the vendors that is a co-founder of the Mark Alliance is Content Stack. And I've known Content Stack before they actually got started. They were previously build.io um, and, and then Content Stack, which is a, a headless CMS vendor, uh, really came out of that uh, API-centric approach that they that they developed. Um, and so uh, they are one of a whole generation of vendors that emerged in the kind of 2015, 2016 space when people started to realize that you could take this much more componentized headless approach to web commerce and web content. Um, and one of the pioneers, which is also a Mark Alliance member, is Netlify, who pioneered the whole concept of Jamstack, which is um, JavaScript, API and um, and markup uh, approaches to uh, generating um, uh, a much more headless approach to uh, to web content, um, and and they're actually turning into quite a, an important enterprise infrastructure player. I didn't put this in my article, but I was kind of thinking about Netlify as kind of the AWS of this kind of composable approach to uh, uh, to, to 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 web sites and applications. Um, so, 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 so the genesis is 2015, 2016, and then Mark Alliance 
they started thinking this through and they founded it like three years ago. And then the first conference was two years ago last year. And this was year two. And we're already seeing some interesting evolution uh, in the maturity of the space. Oh, and I should say, let me add, we are seeing, because this is very much uh, leading edge B2C uh, commerce and content, the consumer brands like Mars, uh, Ikea, Interflora, are some of the ones that uh, that we're talking at this event. We've had at the last event, we had t uh, companies like Lego, Tesco. The, the, there's a whole uh, set of retailers and big global brands that have already gone down this route, have junked their, uh, uh, their, their Oracle and their Salesforce uh, and their Adobe implementations have uh, gone with this more composable approach. Um, so it has very strong enterprise credibility already. Wow, I think I just heard the names of some of our partners. Uh-oh. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, but isn't that the, the edge that we live for, right? We all have to stay on our game in this industry for against the incumbents and the challengers and, and keep our act together. So no one uh, can get too well, comfortable. Yeah. And, you know, those vendors understand that. I mean, you know, they've been through this ringer over and over and over again. Um, you know, they've all, well, some of them were cloud native, some of them adapted to cloud. Um, and, uh, uh, and this is, you know, another iteration of how the technology evolves and the way that you do things has to change again. And you either make that transition or you don't survive. So when we go back to cloud washing, like some of the cloud washing stuff got to be pretty stupid after a while, right? Because, you know, every vendor would accuse different vendors of cloud washing. But what I did mm -hmm. find helpful, what I did find helpful about those discussions is uh, is uh, it kind of provoked a conversation around cloud architectures and and it's my opinion that that you can get yourself into trouble if your architectures don't scale properly for the modern business ends you're trying to achieve. So I think actually the architecture part of these discussions is highly relevant. So do you think that's the same with mock washing? Can we obviously it's a little bit sensationalistic to accuse other people of mock washing and stuff, but does it actually provoke a, a necessary conversation on like what kinds of architectures that we really need now? Well, you know, I think we should be clear here. I use the term mock washing. <laughs> yeah, Brian. Br um, Brian, like Brian likes your I'm wardrobe, about, man. He's impressed. I'm just, about to, I'm just off on vacation, Brian. John pinged me uh, as I'm already <laughs> winding down. So, so I make no. Hey, I'm wearing for a t-shirt dress. I'm wearing a t-shirt also, and I have no excuse. It's four fifteen Eastern time. It's nine fifteen Eastern uh, UK time with Phil joining our broadcast. So he can pretty much, if he yeah. wants to wear a bathrobe, he can. But we'll we'll take the shirt actually. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you, you should, you should thank your lucky stars that I am wearing a shirt, and 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 not just down even further, to be honest. So, um, uh, so yeah. I mean, I use the term mark washing. Mark Alliance is not using the term mark washing. Uh, they're being very careful. They understand that. Uh, that because they're working, as I said, with a lot of um, a, a, a lot of uh, enterprise uh, companies. They understand that people have got all kinds of. Uh, architectures that they have to work with, that the migration is is an iterative one, um, and they don't want to diss people, um, uh, but they do want to enforce their standards. So to be MARC certified, then you have to conform to what the MARC Alliance has defined uh, and probably is still defining, to be honest, as the characteristics of true MARC this platonic ideal I was talking about. Um, and as I referred to in the, 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 the lead to, to that story, um, they have uh, registered a trademark and they have used that trademark to go out and tell Salesforce and Adobe specifically that these were named by uh, Mark Alliance President um, uh, Kelly Goch, who's the Chief Strategy Officer for Commerce Tools, one of the founding partners, founding vendors. Um, uh, those companies have, I don't know who in the company did this, but they have uh, attempted to say they were mark compliant and the alliance has gone out and 
use their trademark uh, registration to basically say, no, you cannot use our trademark without our certification. Uh, and I was, I was quite interested to hear him, at, because I asked him directly, you know, are you going on the record on that? And he said yes. Mm. So, um, so they're okay. clearly, you know, very, um, uh, very determined to, to make sure that uh, this means something. And he specifically, and I wrote this in the article, specifically said that we don't want to go down the path we went down with cloud. Uh, and we've seen this with other industry trends as well of, you know, people just seizing the term and making it mean whatever the hell you like. Um, and, and nobody actually knows as an enterprise which vendors they, they, they should be buying from to actually get the full value of the model. Yeah, I think that's important. And the, the other thing I'm really interested in from like a perspective of like future digital content is basically digging into these terms and, 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 and how, how does you get there? Right. Because like yeah. a microservices, yeah. a microservices architecture, I don't care if it's the best thing you've ever, you've ever run on. It's not easy to achieve. Um, well, no, it's not, and 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 this this is something I think the Mark Alliance needs to do more work on. Um, uh, and I was asking a lot of questions, and I have some. Uh, and actually, I was asking some questions at AWS Summit the week before as well, which I attended in London, um, because they're pushing a microservices, a serverless um, a, approach to architecture as well. Um, and um, well, Brian, we expect you to to, to to dress up. Your background, you know, is uh, uh, is, is is much more corporate than uh, than the likes of John and I. Brian, I challenge you to come on to Cam right now. Like, well, not right now, but like in ten minutes or something, and show that you still have a tie on. Let, let's see if you can pull that off. I, I think, to be honest, John, ten minutes is too long. That gives you time to go and get a tie and a shirt. <laughs> yeah, well, let's see what he's got. Let's see what he's up for on a Friday night. Anyway, continuing along. Yeah, yeah. So so, so basically, um, goodness, I've completely lost my thread. What was I ranting on about, John? Oh, yeah. Well, just, just the microservices piece and getting real about yeah. what it takes. Yeah, yeah. So so, so I was digging in, 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 into this because, um, because it isn't just the four things that I mentioned, this API, API thing particularly, you have to drill down to that. Um, and actually, you know, I've had conversations um, with, uh, with, with, with people at Salesforce and, and, and Adobe and so, and, uh, and asked them about like composable. And the answer that tends to come back is, well, we have loads of APIs. Um, so, uh, it, it, and in fact, Salesforce, you know, their line is basically, well, you know, we have more calls to our APIs than anyone else on the planet. So obviously we're composable. Um, but actually, it's really important what your API does, uh, what you're exposing in the API, what you're not exposing in the API. Um, and this is one of the things that came out of, uh, it was a fascinating session that I attended by a chap called Gregor Hopper, who is um, who is uh, uh, on the AWS team, uh, and um, and and uh, and is really an evangelist for a, 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 a you know for serverless computing, and he's basically saying, look, uh, there are a whole load of things that you can do when you write an API, which actually masks off what you're doing. And if you're going to do this properly, you need to expose exactly what the infrastructure is underneath, so that people can uh, uh, can can see what's happening and can make different choices if they want to do that. Um, uh, and, and it's more difficult to write that kind of API. You have to think very carefully about that. It probably means that you have to kind of include more detail in the API um, it, than if you're vertically integrating a lot of stuff underneath the API, but you're making it more composable by doing that. Um, so that's one element of it. Another element is some people use the term orchestration, other people use the term choreography, but you know how you actually bring these APIs together and um, and manage them is a really important part of the story. And um, I've got some more content that I'm going to be developing out of the those two conferences to kind of drill into this uh, further. But um, uh, but there's there's a lot more detail that the Merck Alliance needs to expose about how to write APIs that give you this true, uh, truly composable mark architecture as opposed to the kind of APIs that 
monolith vendors are exposing at the moment. Yeah, I would argue we need to have a more detailed, precise discussion about what composability means too, because I think that mm. word implies that you're kind of really like have this canvas in front of you and doing whatever you want when in fact you're still working within some limitations of the vendors that you've selected and stuff like that. So I think that term needs a little more work. One thing I'm really curious about is if there was any conversations. Now, I don't want to... Oh, by the way, Brian, I noticed that you got very quiet after you got challenged to come on a camera. I don't know what's going on there with your... Maybe you don't want to put your tie on after all, but... I, I, I think he's just ruffling through his wardrobe at the moment, trying to work out which shirt and tie to put on. <laughs> which swag he's going to uh, grace yeah. us with. So I did want to point out, I don't want to like kind of use use one sensational story to sort of discredit all of this, but I do think it was quite notable when the enterprise tech press lit up in the last month about uh, Amazon Prime Video ditching its use of microservices Uh, You saw headlines such as microservices Uh sucks, Amazon goes back to basis, return of the monolith. Uh, And this one from the new stack, you know, which does a good job covering these things, a blog post from the engineering team at Amazon Prime Video has been rolling out cloud native computing with its explanation that at least in the case of video monitoring, a monolithic architecture has produced superior performance over a microservices and services led approach. Now, look, I can understand how a specific use case around prime video and specific monitoring things might not work as well for a microservices based approach. But to me, it does highlight why we need to get much more vigorous in the pros and cons of this discussion rather than just saying that this is the next thing. Well, I thought it was interesting that people wanted to take sides there, um, that there was this big rush to say, oh, microservices has been discredited because we have this one use case where people decided to vertically integrate. And that reminded me again of the sort of the discussions that we got back in the days of, of, of the early days of cloud and SaaS when it was, you know, when I remember Charles Phillips, when he was um, uh, when 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 he was president of Oracle, hauled me back into a briefing at uh, at, at an Oracle uh, Open World event uh, to really kind of uh, because because he could see that I didn't kind of accept the the, the Oracle um, the way that Oracle was doing cloud. He really wanted me to understand that how Oracle was doing cloud in pods mm. was true multi-tenancy, um, but doing it without, uh, the word was commingling customers' data with each other. Um, and, you know, th- this we're having this same kind of purist discussions now in which people who probably don't fully understand what the mark uh, architecture is all about are basically trying to muddy the water with you know different ways of looking at this um you know the, the, the that particular example is an example of the trade off that you make um you either you know there are some cases where in order to get the performance you want to go vertically integrated and you still provide that service uh, that is vertically integrated and high performance within a highly composable environment and people know what you're doing under the cover and why you're doing it, uh, and and they can use that service in their infrastructure as uh, as um, as a service that they can take advantage of, and they do so because it provides a great service. Um, I don't think that conflicts with the composability message. Um, I think it's just an illustration that um, you know for for each application you have to make a trade off between the vertical integration for performance or the uh, the composability and the openness, the transparency for uh, being having the flexibility and the agility to mix and match different capabilities. Uh, one more thing on this. You, you talked about the big B2C brands really getting drawn into this heavily. Why, why do you think this, this B2C use case is, is compelling for this? Well, because the the market is changing so quickly, they and they just uh, you know they just can't move fast enough on on the on the traditional monolithic platforms. Uh, it, you know, it it just it just takes too long to put new stuff in, and and when they put new stuff in, it takes too long to change it again. 
Um, and, and so they have to, for commercial reasons, they have to go to a more composable and more flexible, flexible and a more agile architecture uh, to actually deliver the experiences that they need to, um, to deliver to their customers. And one of the interesting things that one of the people speaking was, was from, from Mars was talking about the fact that now you put chat GPT and other large language models in generative AI as a user interface, and you've got to become even more flexible in terms of being able to accommodate these different user experiences. Um, and if you're trying to do that on a, one of these traditional monolithic architectures, you, you're not able to do it. You, you simply don't have the flexibility. And that, you know, that is a real challenge for the, the names that I mentioned earlier, they have got mm. to really up their game in terms of offering more flexibility on their architecture than they than their customers are experiencing at the moment. Great. And you've written a whole series on Diginomic on this. Is that complete now or is there one more installment? Oh uh, we have the complete we've got I guess the, that's uh, that's always a that's always a trick question, right? Yeah. So so um I I mean the mark to conference was the the best conference I have been to in terms of a um the uh, uh I mean I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna name Emma Keats here who gave me a schedule of interviews that was the best schedule that any PR person has given me uh, wow. for a conference in a rare the past PR call five out. years. Nice. Uh, because um, because you know uh, there were really personal interviews. Um, there were great uh, uh, there, there were great um, uh, sessions recommended, and um, and I came away with a list of eight articles to write, and I've only written three of them. So okay, so the first three are there. The first the three are there. Um, there's uh, there's another couple to come on the architecture itself, and then there are some user stories as well. Brian the other been... thing I would say that if you want to dig into this, because Mark is just one facet of this kind of whole move to composability, I call it tierless architecture. And if you Google search tierless architecture, you'll find my um, uh, my piece on um, uh, on, on Diginomica, which is effectively a, a manifesto setting out um you know what the whole landscape is and and where it's potentially going so brian's been knee deep in a bunch of esg research which is really interesting but he says on a serious note this microservices and integration challenge gets really tough when you consider all the data and feeds needed for esg reporting uh, brian when you come on to the show in a few minutes you can maybe give us a quick capsule of that um, and it turns out Brian was quiet because he was looking for neckties that work with collarless shirts. So that's a pretty good reason, Brian, uh, for taking I, your time. Yeah, that's a really good excuse. I, I, it sounds convincing. It does. It does sound convincing. Well, we'll Brian, to, are you ready for the necktie challenge, man? I'm going to send we, you. A, we have to see the visual evidence. I'm going to send you, um, Brian. I'm going to. I'm going to message you a link, Brian. Actually, I'm, Brian, I'm going to send it to you on. Um, Twitter DM because uh, for some reason I'm logged out. Actually, no, maybe I can do it on LinkedIn. Hang on. So, so while while you're thinking about mm -hmm. that, John, can I just add that one of the articles that is queued up was a fascinating session um, in which uh, one of these um, retail brands was talking about how they've not only gone to, uh, in fact, they um, uh, they divested from. Uh, from a larger brand, um, and they had to build their entire, an entirely new global e-commerce site in four months and go live with it and successfully transact for uh, mm. Black Friday. Um, and they managed that using composable wow. architecture. They have now gone further and they have built their ERP system in a composable architecture. Wow. That, well, there's another incumbent beware notice there. Yeah, I don't hear too yeah. much so, about mic so, microservice-based ERP very often. So, so, so you know, uh, you know, Adobe and Salesforce, we've cited by name as vendors that need to think carefully about this, but there's a whole layer of other vendors that also need to be aware of what's going on here because it's going to 
uh, it's going to reach them. And it, the ESG is a great example of one of the things that is coming down the track, which just requires so much more flexibility, so much more, uh, so many more data points, so much more and real-time data points coming from your uh, your partner and your supplier channel, as well as from your internal organization to, to really report effectively. And a lot of regulation coming very rapidly that makes this a requirement to adapt. So um, I, I do think it's a challenge that the ERP vendors are gonna face very, very rapidly. And uh, uh, Brian's um, Franken, what was it? Frankensoft. Uh, uh, yeah, Frankensoft. Uh, yeah. Frankensoft is going to walk again. <laughs> yeah. What year was that? I think that might've been 2013 when Brian penned that Frankensoft thing on ZDNet, but then a bunch of vendors ran with it and stole Brian's IP. Brian's still burned about that. Hey, Brian, if you want to come on, I sent you a message on LinkedIn with the back end login so you can prove that you're actually wearing a tie. Uh, so Phil, I know you want to head off to your vacation shortly given the time zone issues here but any further observations on your many events you attended was there any other compelling things that you're working on uh well i mean I, uh, since you mentioned it i'm just going to say that i i am very impressed by what adobe has done with generative ai in the mm -hmm. in the design space um in terms of a being very cognizant of the impact on creators and wanting to to uh, and wanting to provide uh, uh, AI generated images that uh, that that do acknowledge the rights of the original creators and potentially compensates them for their contribution. Um, and um, but also, I think Adobe is starting to step up to the challenge of. Uh, using this technology to make design much more accessible. It's the kind of, it's the design equivalent of what low code has done for programming and development in, in the software field. Uh, a whole uh, swathe of, uh, of people in marketing and other functions can now start to access the kind of design technology that they previously had to kind of get in a queue waiting for um, the, the professional designers to create for them. Uh, and that can be done collaboratively with the designer setting guidelines and parameters so that the um, so that the business users can create these things but still do that within uh, uh, within the, the brand guidelines that the organization needs to, to maintain. So so I think that's that's fascinating and, and I think you know we're seeing a huge shift in technology, bringing capabilities to uh, people that didn't uh, didn't have that capacity previously, um, uh, and um, you know the, the the pace at which this is happening. I've been watching this technology uh, of of cloud computing for twenty five years now, and it's still seems to surprise me with the the, uh, the the new twists that come out in terms of how it can automate stuff and help people to kind of achieve more in business. Uh, and, you know, it's going to be fascinating to, to see what happens over the next few years. Yeah, I mean, we could spend a lot of time talking about that. We've all written a lot about that on Diginomica and I, I'm a little notoriously grouchy about this topic at the moment, but I will say that uh, that I, I got to reluctantly give some credit to Adobe just in the sense that I thought I still have to look into a little bit around the artist compensation. I'm not sure that that is really like exactly what I would have wanted to see, but the whole presentation was pretty coherent in terms of how they were training their image library. And then another headline that came up, I don't know if you saw around Adobe is so confident it's Firefly generative AI won't breach copyright that it'll cover your legal bills. You don't see that type of headline every day. And it, yeah. to me, to me, what that does is it shows that they've thought through the the complexities around the risk risk management issues a lot better than a lot of other vendors have, and 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 how to communicate those. And that's been one of. I just wrote this piece on SAP customers and generative AI, and one of the things I pointed out there was that that risk management is still the biggest 
question mark that you're going to get from executives around this, especially CIOs and CFOs and and vendors just haven't done a good job of of dealing with that. But I thought Adobe was much more well thought in how they presented that. And by the way, they're not currently a client, so <laughs> there's, no, there's no no reason to be no reason to sing their praises in that regard. But you know, it is you know credit where credits due is basically what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. Are we ready to see Brian's tie? Here we go. Yeah, I'm there. Uh, wow. Like, uh, George uh, McCardo or something like that. But anyway, yeah. I've got Over, overdressed by Brian Summer. I got to no. tell you folks, I got to tell you folks, it won't be the last time and it's certainly not the first. Brian, you know, I was old school. Up. Keeping I was brought going. up professionally to always be dressed one notch better than my clients. And in y'all's case, it's probably five or six notches. But anyway. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm not even sure if we can like put it on the same scale. You know? <laughs> yeah. So sorry for the slam, guys. But it's, uh, yeah. you know, it's almost five o'clock on a Friday. I mean, you're getting me at my No, absolutely. No doubt. No doubt. I kind of feel like I'm at a job fair interviewing for a spot at your firm. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I think I just failed the interview. So, um, <laughs> So I'm I'm, I'm going to have to bow out because otherwise sure. I'm going to get in trouble for delaying dinner. So um, okay, cool. So, uh, it's um, uh, it's good to catch up, and I will see you guys on the other side of my vacation. Sounds good, Phil. Thanks for joining. Catch you. Okay, thank you.